take off by saying thank you, merci, miigwetch to everybody here for joining us for this panel discussion on the 2020 federal budget analysis. Um, as you all know, we're living in extraordinary time. Extraordinary measures are being taken. We don't have a regular federal budget to work with for this discussion. Um, and so the discussion will be a little bit broader. We'll, we'll of course discuss the, the recent investments that have been made over the past uh, few years, but we'll also take a look at the COVID funding and what needs to change and shift in the, in the, in the general ecosystem to ensure that we have a sustainable arts and culture ecosystem going forward. So introductions. Today we have Negan Sinclair in Manitoba. We've got Mark Campbell in Ontario. Locke Dow in British Columbia. Mary Elizabeth, who goes by M.E. Luca, um, who's from Nova Scotia, but is now in Ontario. Lindsay Fisher in Ontario. Laurence Dubuc from Quebec. Welcome, bienvenue à tout le monde. Over to you, Bridget. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chaku. Um, so I'm Bridget and I'm here representing Mass Culture, which is uh, the organizer of this conversation. And we're so happy to have such a great panel together today. A bit about Mass Culture, it started as an ad hoc collective uh, dreamt up by arts enthusiasts back in 2015. In 2019, it successfully merged with the Canadian Conference of the Arts and retained the Mass Culture name while adopting the conference's charitable number and its 60 plus year history of arts research history. Through the support of the Toronto Arts Council, the Open Door Program uh, through the Arts Council, and through a partnership with the Ontario Trillium Foundation, Mass Culture has convened over 1600 scholars and arts leaders across Canada in conversations that are focused on arts research and other um, issues that are facing the arts and culture community. These conversations have aided in discovering what areas of research are uh, relevant and um, crucial to the sector. And it also informs how mass culture can best operate to connect, amplify, and identify new collaborators uh, for arts research. And today's panel is one of many initiatives uh, to gather insights and perspectives on the many issues that face Canada's arts and culture sector. And so again, we'd just like to thank all of um, the panelists here for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And also before I give it back to you, Aku, I do wanna share a land acknowledgement um, to, to help set the tone and just give respect to the space. Um, I recognize that Mass Culture's offices are based in Toronto in a traditional indigenous territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Our panelists today, though, come from across Canada, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to meet and work across these territories with each of you. I'd also like to express gratitude to Mother Earth and for all the resources that we are using today. And I wish to honor all the First Nation, Métis and Inuit people who have been living on this land since time immemorial. So Aku, on that note, I'd like to hand it back to you. All right, um, just a quick note that um, everyone's bio will be posted on the Mass Culture website when um, this recorded session is posted. Um, so if anyone's curious about the experience that everyone's bringing to the table, please do check that out. Let's begin. What does sustainability mean for the arts and culture sector right now? The vectors of change are all around us. We've got climate change, truth and reconciliation, Black Lives Matter, we've got Cripping the Arts, COVID-19, we've got digital transformation on a global scale. There are so many factors around us that are shaping the universe that we work in 
and having an impact on, on the way we work in the arts and culture sector. So what does sustainability mean and what assumptions need to be interrogated? Who would like to start off? Uh, okay, I'll start. Um, so, bonjour everybody. Bonjour de Magre Duk, Nigan Webadam, the Digital Cost Namel Shindo Dem, Nimen Wendam Omayayan, Ganabach Bungi, Niben Agujing. Coming to you all the way from Treaty One territory here in uh, Manitowabo, uh, Winnipeg, and so it's nice to see everyone. Uh, and so, uh, the concept of sustainability in the arts is kind of a it's kind of a, uh, um, first of all, it's kind of a, a misnomer only in that uh, the arts are so uh, the first thing cut in, in every kind of major governmental move. And so to talk about sustainability in the arts is always to be aware of power and is to always to be aware that we are, we are at the mercy of power in terms of arts organizations that are dependent on funding. And so I guess the first thing that I would say about sustainability is the notion that art isn't reliant on government and that art will continue regardless of government funding or not. And that while we are going to talk a lot about money today, um, it's a matter of understanding that art will reside no matter what. And I'm thinking about our relatives right now in Portland who are fighting literally for their lives every night um, against a draconian dictator government uh, which is very nearby to us, who looks very similar to our government uh, in many different ways. And the art that's being produced out of uh, resistance and mobility and, and struggle is probably what the most sustainable art that there is, which is the reminder that we are here, that we will continue, and that those things, regardless of the forces that seek to dominate art, will continue to uh, reside within the very expression of saying, we are here. We are here, we are not going away, and we are present. We are, we are experiencing the moment, we are reacting to the moment, but most importantly, sustainability, I think, resides in the notion that we are making the world uh, a place in which others can then uh, inherit it. And they inherit space, they inherit the politics and the ideas and the aesthetics of all the things that we do within this lifetime. But the sustainability in the arts is probably the most important thing to think about in terms of not not thinking that it's tied to money, but in mm -hmm. fact is the resistant form to money. It's the expression of uh, our presence on the earth and on this place and in this time as an indication for those who are coming after us that they too can inherit something. And I'm thinking a lot about my daughter. Um, and if you talk to Indigenous writers, as just an example, uh, no Indigenous writer will ever say, I'm doing this um, like they'll say they'll, I'm doing it for a living. They'll say I'm doing it for to express myself. I'm doing it to resist the moment. But the number one answer will be I'm doing this for my children. I'm doing this for my nieces and my nephews. And I'm doing this so that others don't have to experience or want or can experience uh, those things in which I have experienced. And so that's what uh, I think sustainability really means. Lindsay, please. You can't, are you on mute? Yeah, hi. Sorry. That, that that's like slapping in ASL. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, I, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, one thing I've been thinking about when I think about um, the meaning of sustainability um, in the culture sector is, for me, it's really about relationships mm -hmm. and collaborations that are, that are built on um, trust and respect and <clears throat> a common uh, ground and vision. So I think there's like, uh, like when the question around what, what do we want to interrogate? For me, I think I, in the last year, have really been interrogating the concept of, exp of the expert mm -hmm. and um, what that is. And when we, when we talk about digital transformation and um, and like, you know, you were just saying that there's a lot of association with money and power uh, that comes with expertise in the digital sector. So I think for me, it's been this feeling of um, how do we build more trustworthy relationships between those sectors and how can we ensure that uh, vulnerable sectors are not at the mercy of this highly moneyed uh, industry. 
<clears throat> and that vulnerable groups are protected and recognized as having as much, if not even more, uh, essential and valuable knowledge and expertise. So I don't know how, what that looks like, but I feel like this is a real moment where we need to start building better relationships um, to be sustainable. If I can jump in, I thought that the, the two, uh, two previous answers were um, very uh, inspiring. I also think that uh, sustainability is a concept uh, rooted for me in very political notions uh, such as empowerment and resilience. Uh, and for me, um, I think that what we've been uh, seeing is that the arts and culture sector has been um, challenging the assumption uh, that change affects everyone the same way. We've seen, uh, we've seen, for instance, like more investment targeting a specific population, such as uh, arts workers. So I feel that like every, uh, we've, we're witnessing very positive changes, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, we need more policies ensuring uh, equality, uh, which in my opinion would rely on a decolonial approach. And we definitely uh, need to foster empowerment and autonomy uh, in artist communities. And this uh, relates to what Lindsay uh, was just saying by stepping away uh, from short-term project-based support and really give them uh, the means uh, that these communities need uh, to build sustainable uh, communities and practices. I think that uh, every single vector of change that we've been witnessing in the past years, uh, climate change, uh, truth and reconciliation, but also Black Lives Matter and Me Too, COVID-19 uh, has definitely pointed out that change does not affect everyone the same way and that uh, many different vulnerable uh, populations have been confronted to a lot more negative consequences than other dominant groups. I think it's really important we acknowledge that uh, systemic discrimination exists in Canada and uh, what we need uh, are uh, policies ensuring uh, equality. And this comes through laws, uh, funding guidelines, organizational policies, government policies, uh, et cetera. I'd like to jump in and, and yeah, come back to this question of power. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's a power struggle between uh, the folks that are grassroots and living a certain kind of art. Um, and the struggle between a government that that funds these arts art forms or attempts to fund art forms as a means of governmentality so so mm -hmm. on the street these vectors of change they seem like eruptions but i feel like the question of sustainability is about how do arts communities get back to a notion of their selves that don't necessarily borrow the language of corporate organizations it doesn't borrow the language of uh, government funding agencies but is embedded in the language of the folks that are part of that community so whether that's a, an artistic community or a cultural community or both but people are able to define their own terms and think about um, sustainability might for some groups it might be talking about children sustainability for others might be talking about land and space or sustainability might be talking about sort of a theoretical and a kind of ontological sense of self that might be outside of the status quo. So I see that struggle every, every now and then uh, in arts communities that there's an attempt to wrestle back their concepts and their ideas of what art could be and what it should look like and how it should uh, intersect with the rest of society. And that's always, always seems to be bumping up against sort of the latest funding call or the latest urgent uh, RFP or something like that that's coming out from a government agency that wants to address a problem um, that you know that uh, that is sort of mandated to the you know for the government to deal with. So I, I think sustainability, like just questioning the concept, is important. But it, there's also that that's you know what we're seeing on the streets is part of that power struggle, and 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 some of it is just about defining terms, like how do you evaluate what you're doing, and maybe our evaluations don't have to be. And metrics don't just have to be, you know, quantitative and qualitative. Maybe there's another way to think about life and, uh, and its relationship to art. Yeah, so I'd like to, to say that I, I agree with all the points that we've discussed so far. Um, I wanted to just expand on a couple of them. I went to the dictionary definition of sustainability just, you know, as a starting point. 
journalism background, right? So, um, and one of the dictionary definitions is avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. And I was thinking about how does that apply to culture, right? And is it ensuring the survival of our cultural resources to maintain a societal balance? Um, that's just a starting point. But yeah, to, to, um, to touch on Laurence's point, for me, the long-term evolution of art and culture has to, has to start with proper government and, 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 and then commercial support for the arts, right? Supports in policy and, and in, in funding, however we change the funding structures and, and the, the details. Uh, but I've, I've um, been in the, uh, this world since um, the early 90s and I, you know, all I've seen is cuts, 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 right? Since, you know, for, since day one on the job, I went through the 95 cuts at CBC, right? And, and everything has been um, d downhill in terms of the, the proper ratios of uh, support for the arts. Um, at the, you know, at the NFB, I was, we were really lucky that we, we went through this time of um, Creative Canada, which um, I was involved in advising the minister and the increase of funds again, but they, those are just stopgap, right? And they don't even equal the, the long-term um, cuts that have happened uh, over time, right? So I think, I think that's something that we can't, we can't forget, even when we get new money, right? We're happy, but it's when you look at historically at the big picture and you look at in, inflation and the and, right the value of the dollar and it's it's nowhere near the same right and like many of you i'm sure we have had the opportunity to work in co-productions and other organizations in europe right and it's always eye-opening we're always comparing to the united states but you compare it to to european funding and it reminds you of <laughs> what could be right I'll just round out and I, I also would be very supportive of everything that everyone has said. Um, I think like a lot of you have also been kind of circling around in, uh, in this area in the arts, media and culture um, since the since the mid 80s. One of the things that I think is really interesting is to look at those cycles, right? To look at the cycles of funding, refunding, uh, defunding and how that happens in terms of government and what a difference that funds can make, funding can make. Part of what um, is really interesting about this particular moment um, has been exactly that grassroots action that has uh, and, and we see those cycles as well right where there may be funding in the system but more importantly there's actually work that's happening on the ground that surfaces and that can be supported and lifted up by organizations that have been supported even even through cuts, right? Similarly, a bit went through a lot of cuts at CBC as well. And think about how as a community, as a cultural community, um, we can lift up the actions of all of the others um, in the world that we're working in um, and do that on a, as consistent a basis as possible. And the other thing that I um, like to add is I wanna come back to the original point, which was about thinking about generations to come and thinking about what it is that we're teaching through the things that we do to practice sustainability um, and I uh, you know that's one of the things that I think is is um, is really hopeful about this moment okay so what I'm hearing is, is actually in this conversation around sustainability a bit of a tension um, between and it's reflective of the power struggle like if we're putting money into a system inevitably there's power struggle but when we, when we take the money off the table and we think about what the role of art is at a foundational level, um, art and creative expression is going to be there and is going to exist at a grassroots level no matter what, whether there's funding there or not. That said, funding is necessary on some level in order to ensure that resources are there for cultural production. And where governments put their priority on that or don't, um, tells a lot about a society and we're fortunate that there's been some new funding in recent years but we know that those significant new investments in the arts and culture sector follow other cycles where there have been cuts so where are we in terms of our resilience what vulnerabilities have been exposed during the COVID crisis and and what needs to be done who'd like to like to start I'll say quickly about the the notion of resilience um, the when cuts happen, uh, they most often uh, then and then the money comes back. It's mo they most often come back as a replacement. They're not really new money, and 
what ends up happening is that what's reified is the like art is consistently moving and changing and it, there's probably you know i can't think of a time period maybe in the 19th century in which uh, art and technology were so deeply tied together and mm -hmm. as a result of this uh this intersection between art and technology art is shifting so quickly like for example it doesn't make sense uh, financial sense, it doesn't make political sense, it doesn't make economical sense to keep funding the CBC at the tremendous amounts of funding in which they get, and then at the cost most often of small local journalism, which is dying because of a lack of support and also the great rise in things like Facebook, which is modifying and changing media in radical ways and not in good directions. 140 characters is no nuance, and what you get is you get more and more binaries, bipolarity, uh, what you see in the United States and also, frankly, uh, throughout Canadian society. And, and, it, and it, it comes at the cost of local journalism and arts-based, uh, local-based arts organizations that um, are coming up. They offer new ways of technology, new ways of development, but yet the federal government just falls back into the same old funding, the same five bodies over and over and over again, replacing the funds that had, it had cut you know, two governments previous to that. And the real problem, I think, is that uh, resilience um, comes from kind of giving up. It's kind of a giving up on governmental forms of looking at new technology because they're too busy trying to reify the old structures. And the, the bottom line of it is, is that, it, I mean, if we wait for governments to help us, we're never they're, we're going to be waiting forever because they, they don't tend to focus particularly on new works, new technologies. And, and we saw that particularly with the way Indigenous arts is seen at the Canada Council. Um, most Indigenous art is commercial, has never been uh, for aesthetics cases for in, in art galleries, for example. And finally, we get the Canada Council to look at Indigenous art as commercial, uh, and that's where Indigenous art really resides. And then, and then suddenly uh, Canada Council gets cut and then all of those initiatives fall by the wayside. And so that new tech, all the work of that new technology uh, kind of falls, falls off or that advocacy and that lobbying. And, and what ends up happening is that those art forms just continue anyways. And they, what they do is the resilience is found within the giving up on governmental systems. And, and I think that's, that's an important thing to recognize. And, and it's also an important thing to uh, identify in the time of COVID is that uh, it's going to continue regardless, but we should stop f focusing specifically on governmental sources in which to obtain those. Now, the problem with that, of course, is then corporate entities come in and then begin to, uh, uh, we'll say, compromise your artistic expression, particularly when it comes to relationships with large corporations. And, and the uh, newspaper that I work for, as an example, has had to create relationships with Facebook, which inevitably, hopefully, doesn't you know, influence, has yet to influence some of our journalism, but could at any point. I might jump in again. I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting about what you're saying is that what part of the kind of infrastructure that we're trying to create um, in the sector is to figure out how people can make a living and I and I and practice the work in the way that they want to practice their work right both at the individual level cultural level and also kind of the social level um, many all those many um, uh, places um, and one when I think about how funding works in the culture sector one of the things that I'm really interested in is watching where the money travels right so when I see it travel across to arts councils or I see it travel into funds that are meant to support uh, the music industry or that support the film industry, the way in which that can move as quickly and simply as possible into the hands of artists so that they can do the work that they need to do, whether it's commercial or not commercial or whatever the particular combination is, that's what I think is really crucial. And how do we set up a structure that allows funding to flow through government or otherwise that will that will land with creative work and then and then we have to grapple with questions like copyright and intellectual property um, and thinking about how that how that works in this country yeah. it's so crucial to remember that a lot of the copyright questions in this country um, are not because the artists don't hold copyright in their own work and the pe people who are copyright holders are protected by the copyright act versus artists who are not necessarily protected anyway that's a whole other question but i do think that following the that flow of money and one of the things that i think COVID has shown is if government steps in and does a, a socially a wide social intervention 
like basic income, then artists are lifted as much as anybody else. And that are working on behalf of everybody to make sure that we are in a sustainable, sustainable environment, whether we're professional artists or not. This is one of the things that I think is really interesting about this moment, that there's evidence here that could really be turned to an interesting purpose, right? Uh, I'm not going to um, speak more about after this, but, but you know, the one thing that's interesting about COVID is when the money needs to be found, it's found. And it's all about priority. And it's all about politics. And when, and, you know, if there's anything that, the, you know, how many years have the government said, well, we can't fund that. That's just a totally impossible but yet they found literally hundreds of billions of dollars in 24 hours for uh i mean granted i mean a legitimate reason a pandemic but that just tells you that if they make arts the priority money is always there so we've had flat funding in the culture sector for a few decades and then we started seeing new investment and we've talked about how that new investment is really new investment when you consider how flat it was for how many years and how depressed everything had become. And there had also, in addition to that, been cuts. Um, but when we look at what the focus of those new funding streams, those two are political decisions. And we're seeing cultural export and digital strategies are, are figuring fairly prominently. Are these areas of urgency? And if we consider the cumulative impact of increase, increases or how the flows of funding have happened over time, what stands out most and why? Can I jump in and, and talk a little bit about digital strategy and, and cultural export? Yeah. Because uh, I, I think these things were urgent in 2010, really. Um, the urgency is actually really passed. Once, um, once there was... Uh, you know, uh, these multi-platform uh, media giants controlling everything on the internet. Once that was the case, you know, which was easily by 2008, nine, uh, it was already too late for Canada to think about exporting any of their culture or, or even getting themselves in the game. And the same thing kind of goes with digital strategy, but that's deeply, I mean, tech is also tied to the level of precarity in which arts communities are held by governmental agencies, right? So, uh, you know, having worked in and run a nonprofit and founded one, you know, thinking about adopting the latest technology in your, um, in your list of priorities and surviving in your small nonprofit, you know, learning how to do a TikTok comes way below writing grants, applying for grants, meeting with funders, um, you know, doing the research with your, with your target audience. So, of course, when you're when you're held in in a level when organizations are held at such um, precariousness, you know, living from grant to grant, living on project grants, when there is something new that happens in society, nobody has the bandwidth. Um, I I personally will implicate myself. I was working in a nonprofit in 2008, and one of the people I was working with, she said, "Look at this thing called Twitter. It's so amazing." And I sat there and I was like, "Actually, I'm really." way too busy. I don't have time for 140 characters. I got to write this, I got to do that. And now today, it would be almost impossible to think of, of uh, doing our work without Twitter. Mm -hmm. But I literally as an ED had to think I cannot even think about prioritizing this new thing called Twitter, like I don't even. So, uh, you know, I, and that just really comes back to to how, uh, how, how short the string is when when you are playing this game of, of nonprofit project funding, even operating funding too. Law, from the cultural industry's perspective, um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with the one point that digital strategies are, are late to the game, and that has a lot to do with governments in power and, and bureaucracies. Um, I do have to say that you know, we, we wrote the NFB digital strategy in 2009 right, and executed it in 2010 and it made a world of difference, right? It turned the NFB around. Um, I'm no longer there, but it turned the NFB around um, in a way that um, was, was not possible in many other organizations. I did want to touch on one, one point about government funding, just to say that personally, um, I don't agree with a lot of the way funds are allocated in our funding system today. I've been a behind the scenes critic of that. I've advised the CMF and and um, um, I've um, politely turned down being part of other uh, arts organizations, uh, juries or advisors, you know, for that reason. Um, 
And I think that, first of all, we have to establish um, what, what percentage as a country and a society do we want to dedicate to the arts from our tax revenue, from our, right, from our, at the high level. After that, you know, do we have the same um, organizations we have now? Should they be run the same? I don't think so, right? And that's why I participated in, uh, as an advisor to, to Minister Jolly at the time, because a lot of the things we discussed was a complete upheaval of all the organizations, right? The discussions around that and the reality, of course, I learned quite a bit there, even, even though I had spent years being working in journalism, um, it was really eye-opening to see the influence of industries and lobbies on, on the actual reality of, um, of making change, right? So that, that, was, um, that was very, very interesting. In terms of digital strategies now, um, yeah, it's, it's, in some cases, I think it's better late than never um, because, you know, what, what, what does that mean in terms of if you don't do that, right? And in terms of some uh, like highlights, like I'm working on a, a project here in BC called Sound On. It's a, it's a music relief and uh, recovery fund and we've received money from <clears throat> the private industry and the uh, so we have $200,000 from the province of BC and then we have a lot of corporate sponsors right and we're we're operating in hybrid rules where we we have some from government rules but we we're being a lot more nimble in how we're distributing the money right into the hands of presenters and artists and people in the music industry right and it's a really interesting model to look at you know how how we could do work differently um, starting with funding, right? And same thing with the, the NFB, right? Where you can start with funding, but you have a much more collaborative uh, approach where you work with people and, you, and you're a lot closer to the ground, right? To artists, to real life, to the grassroots. And you can be part of that and part of that change as opposed to, you know, sitting in, you know, your office and going through jury processes, right? Mm -hmm. um, Lindsay, I'm, go I'm going to... Um, redirect to you because I think, you know, from the perspective of um, disability in the arts, accessibility, um, what, what does this mean for, for a group of, of people who aren't necessarily front and center on the radar all the time in funding environments? Well, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a, I feel a bit like I'm small potatoes uh, in this conversation, but I, I think for the question around what, what stands out for me in terms of these investments is, um, as an organization, we, we are just struggling. We're very, very small, and our, our, man, our real kind of mandate or mission is to really support artists with disabilities. And we got a digital strategy grant um, 18 months ago, and most of it went to hiring, <clears throat> you know, the experts. And here, and, and, and it was a real weird, surreal thing where we were like, for 18 months, we, we had all this money, but it, it was like, it was going to this research and uh, development around digital strategy. And yet we were still struggling as, uh, as artists. Um, so I don't know what that, what that means, but I think for me, it, it feels like you're something, and it goes back to my, the feeling around needing to figure out how, I don't know if it's regulation or figuring out how to match like how to build better relationships between these sectors because I think it just feels a little bit like there's potential for exploitation or I don't know I it's it just feels a little bit uh, unsafe and mm -hmm. what, what weird <laughs> I don't know that's not the right right word for it but Definitely doesn't feel right. Laurence, has Quebec done anything differently than the rest of Canada in, in terms of thinking about these things and, and how has that played out? I feel that, you know, this question was about uh, digital strategies, but uh, one thing that came 
uh, to my mind was also uh, in the light of COVID-19, uh, the fact that uh, the digital, we we're seeing a digital turn also of uh, funding programs, right? Uh, at the Canada Arts Council, but also uh, in Quebec with the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec. And uh, this is something that's been uh, interesting, especially uh, when we think about how this uh, affects individual artists, uh, because I feel that the way the government, federal and provincial, have reacted uh, really created an imbalance between support for uh, organizations and support for individual artists on one side. But the thing is that uh, for individual artists, right, uh, if you create new funding programs along a digital turn, the thing is that money is like, it's never guaranteed, right? So you need to apply with uh, new specific programs. This uh, also takes time. It's uh, the decision is based upon peer recognition and uh, and so all this risk uh, has to be uh, bear uh, by artists, by individual artists. So I feel that this, uh, this was exactly the same logic in the Quebec revival plan. Uh, and it, it's also not really suited to certain artistic disciplines. Like I'm more focused, my research is more focused in the visual arts. So apart from like uh, media artists, uh, the digital turn is very difficult. But also this is the other point I had in mind was that it creates also an imbalance between uh, the activities who are located at the beginning and the end of the cultural value chain, right? And so this is a problem. Uh, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And also in the light of, I know we're gonna speak about this later, um, but these new funding streams and these new tendencies uh, really make it all uh, the more pressing to review the Copyright Act because the way that the system is structured uh, right now could uh, indirectly contribute to precarizing artists on the long run. Precarity. To go back to the the, the, the idea, um, Emmy, I'm going to pick on you now, um, uh, because you raised um, like broader social initiatives um, like universal basic income and how that has more of a tendency to lift all boats and enable more people um, and ensure that everyone has the support they need to do the work that they need to do. It, it removes that bit of precarity that Laurence just talked about. Are there other countries, um, you've done a fair amount of research internationally, are there other countries who are addressing this in different ways um, that we could maybe look at and, and learn from? Well, there are, and it happens, I mean, it kind of happens in ebbs and flows, right? It also happens in, I mean, it happens in Canada too, periodically, where, where things, where funding, the way that funding flows really shifts. And that, I think, is really interesting to look at. You, Locke, talk, you talked about what happened at the NFB in kind of 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009, when that digital strategy was implemented. Well, 10 years earlier at CBC, same thing, right? There was a real take up of how do you uh, actually think about the internet as a platform. And alongside that was the move to, to broadband, right, in Canada. And we can we can see that Canada's position in relation to that, those big systems of technology, um, really, uh, Canada was a leader in the late 1990s, right through to almost 2010, and then boom, dropped way off the radar. Um, similarly, countries that actually took up some of those infrastructural challenges provided resource in communities at large. And it kind of goes to one of the other questions that I know we're going to talk about, which is when we think about what the digital divide is now, what we're talking about is a systemic divide at so many levels, whether we're talking in urban centers around class um, or access and um, where towers are, or we're talking about um, some of the divides that take place because of distance, right? So Nunavut is a, is a case in point. There are other lots of other locations in northern any province is is a problem um in terms of the, that kind of access um and i you know and i it's it is one of the things that i think is really super interesting is you we can look at a place like ireland which funds its artists or we can look at a place um, even in Quebec, where the structure is more oriented towards individual artists um, than it is in the rest of Canada, um, except possibly the territories, um, and think about how um, how we could uh, 
design something that is specific for that region or design something that's specific for genres and regions. And I think one of the challenges that we have is when we think about policy, we think about regulation and we think about um, rules around how funding is applied instead of thinking about what are the opportunities that get created, right? So for example, um, at the Nova Scotia Arts Council, part of what we did with extra funding was to basically create a good idea fund. And this is not a new idea, right? Lots of people have done it before, but it's that kind of like, who is it who hasn't been funded, who has a good idea, who just needs some risk, some risk money, right? To kind of go, okay, I'm guaranteed three months solid income and this other resource and I can do the work that I want to do. Um, there was some investment, uh, a lot of investment in Australia in the 2000s around the cultural industries in particular that I think we could look at. Um, the way that it's fallen off and how it's being regenerated now is really interesting. Even funding education, if you fund education, you are funding artists because artists are more educated than many other sectors of the population. So, you know, there's lots of ways in which we look to other sectors and think, uh, and again, if we do, we think about it as a, as a, as a kind of a, a move in society, and we're not trying to create an elite that has access to special money, then we're, then we're in a position where, where people really can, uh, where lives can be improved. And I just wanna come back to the question of COVID for a second around this and particularly around um, access, right? And thinking about, uh, for, uh, thinking about uh, how digital technology can help people who um, are not as mobile as, as uh, the rest of society and that part of what we saw by being locked into our houses was that if we have better systems of actually communicating in an outward facing fashion, that's gonna lift everybody, right? We can continue to do certain kinds of work in a way that, um, that, we, that we weren't doing before. So I think, again, there's evidence and there's interesting developments that we could be really picking up on. Okay, well, that does lead into our discussion on, on digital divide. Um, and we, we know that it's not just rural, remote, and northern Canada who suffer in that digital divide. As you mentioned, Emmy, class is often a part of that too. And, you know, the digital divide, I'll just say, right here in Ottawa, today, I'm hotspotting my phone. I'm one hour outside of Ottawa. That's not very rural. This is not northern Quebec. This is, uh, this is uh, 45 minutes from Gatineau, Ottawa area. Um, and yet I have to hotspot my phone to have a stable connection to facilitate a conversation that's national. So when we think about what kinds of resources and approaches are needed in order to ensure that there's opportunities for cultural engagement um, and dissemination of cultural production, um, what needs to be done? And then I'm gonna tack on a, a little extra question just because I'm inspired by how the conversation has been going and, and some of Negan's contributions. A lot of people talk about the right to be discovered. Some people also talk about the right to disappear. And that's all connected to the digital world of, of, that we live in as well. Um, so let's dive in. Like who wants to, who wants to lead us off on the, on the digital divide today? Well, I mean, I've been waiting for this one because I think the um, the, the obvious uh, built like right now I, I am also a professor at the at a university and so mm. we're preparing for online classes for the next year, and the fact is that a uh, because I'm an in, uh, Indigenous studies Native studies and a, a large portion of my students are Indigenous and therefore like like bandwidth is not even an option in communities so uh, Zoom classes are not an option uh, and so accessibility is not an option like it's just a matter of like which one are we going to pick <laughs> um, and the the true the real challenge is that in terms of the arts I was with a, a working artist last night who doesn't have bandwidth uh, and she's been working on uh, projects that will be uh, exhibited in Australia and and now it's gotten to the point where they uh, not only is the exhibit um, up for negotiation or potentially cancellation, but then all of the other funding that goes along with her plans for her work uh, ends as well. And, and so 
the issue of accessibility is such a pivotal one in terms of thinking about the ways arts uh, is funded and the way that it's funded is always project-based work. Um, there's no infrastructure-based work. And that just ignores a major issue, which is that um, artists, one of the motivating factors around art is, is expression based within experience. And some of those experiences at times are based in um, you know, fighting oppression or uh, dealing with poverty or um, you know, dealing with systemic oppression. And so indirectly through project-based funding, uh, not only are you disenfranchising those who are in situations where they don't have infrastructure, um, but that you're also, who are you, who are you uh, marginalizing? You're actually marginalizing racialized people, um, people who have, are already marginalized by society, LGBTQ communities. Um, you're, you mean, I mean, like, think about it in terms of uh, when we base our funding, our arts funding only on project-based funding, what you're doing, and you never deal with the infrastructure issue, you've effectively, without saying it, completely uh, cut out a racial, a racial people. And you've cut out completely people in poor communities. You've cut out completely people who are, who don't have access to the, you know, extreme um, cost of that it takes if you, uh, for instance, are visual, visually impaired. Um, or you don't have, you know, you've got to pay for five times the cost for your technology as a result of your, um, your that, that is no fault of your own. And um, so it's, it's a direct, uh, almost attack that the arts community has by basing everything and just pretending that infrastructure is not an issue. Yeah. Mark, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could. There's, I feel like there's, there's <laughs> I know uh, you can. Yeah, I feel like there, there's a lot sitting here. And uh, I feel like, um, you know, one of the approaches that, that um, is clearly coming up in this conversation is, is one of, of thinking about what does equity actually mean, <laughs> right? Um, and how is it different than equality or these blanket statements of, you know, uh, the entire university is going online so every one of our students can have access to a class, right? Um, I think it's very much uh, part of, uh, uh, it's very much part of uh, the, our existing relations that, you know, like for me, the status quo means, um, it means investing in inequity, right? Like I have a, like a larger sort of conversation that I think needs to be had about the, the entire structure of, of Western capitalist society. And that it's just, you know, in the last question, I didn't jump in um, talking about precarity and also just thinking about uh, sort of underdevelopment, strategic underdevelopment, right? So if you, if you, it's almost like punishing people that aren't willing to come to the city to be the exploited labor force that you need to advance at your, your society. So why, why give them attention? It, it's literally, um, it feels like or it looks like a, a form of punishment because you're unwilling to either completely assimilate, which is probably an old way of thinking about it, but you're unwilling to become that exploitable labor class that's needed to keep the, the social uh, imbalance, you know, continuing. So I, I you know, when I, when I read about, I, I don't have a lot of experience in, in Northern Ontario or in rural areas in Canada. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the strategic approach of, of, of ensuring that you have, like underdevelopment is a strategy, it's a governmental strategy um, mm -hmm. and it's not Canadian. And it, I mean, this is literally, you know, part of a nation and national strategies of governing people. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah. go ahead. Well, I'm, I just, I, it just popped into my mind as you were talking, um, Mark, um, the reserve system is part of that. Um, when I think back at, uh, about how black loyalists were allocated land um, after the War of Independence in the States, um, it was always poor land that wasn't arable, um, but geographically located so that, that those people could become a cheap source of labor and reproduce a power hierarchy that they had just left behind in the States. Um, and that wasn't actually left behind, it was here in Canada as well. Um, and so what we're seeing map, mapping out is a virtual version of the same pattern emerging in a new way, um, but it's not new, it's very old, 
Yeah. Um, and when we talk about structural change and what needs to happen in, in terms of systems change, and when we talk about decolonization, um, how do we get at that? Um, um, I, I just want to, I mean, I, I don't want to, I feel like I've talked too much already, but anyways, no, you haven't. Um, no like at, at some point we all have to talk about the fact that art is oppression and has been used as an oppressive force mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the notion that uh, art is not tied in with uh, the colonial domination is just just an illusion and, or just a lie. Right now I'm involved with a, uh, um, a, uh, a we'll call it a discussion uh, in uh, a major uh, community in Ontario involving the installations of Sir John A. Macdonald, like artistic expressions of Sir John, Sir John A. Macdonald. And, and just the idea that I have to explain to people that Sir John A. Macdonald is not a historical figure that is without genocide. I mean, he is tantamount to genocide. And it's not a matter of erasing history by removing that installation. It's a matter of creating safe environments for people to have conversations. You can't, like you would never expect anybody to, who has been abused to have a statue of their abuser right in front of them and say, oh, well, let's, let's have a conversation. Like, like it is, it, the, the idea of removing statues, I think is just one example or public art of a, a conversation around the ways in which art, I think the removal of art is the art, artistic expression. And particularly you're seeing with the, the ways in which communities are uh, oftentimes called defacing, or I call it redecorating or editing uh, those public installations because the, uh, the notion of public art as not being colonial and full of uh, dominating powers is just a, is a false illusion. And, and, and the removal of those statues, I think, is like a public editing of space that is based in the artistic practice of that society. And, and so, you know, like if, I, at some point, I'd, I'd like for us all to sort of define what art's supposed to do, and then what does it look like? And I think, um, you know, that's why I, look, I work a lot with graffiti, uh, and I work a lot with um, expressions of you know, like murals, public murals, which are often small project-based, very small project funding, but are some of the most radical, interesting art that's being done here in Treaty 1 territory, Winnipeg. Locke, in the cultural industry space, like, how is this playing out in cultural industries? Um, to, to the digital divide question? Yeah. Or, or yeah. Art? Okay. You know, it's something that people have been aware of for a long time. Like when I was at, at CBC, when, one of the pilot projects we tried um, was taking that into account. And it was called CBC Home Delivery that used technology in a, in a different way for low bandwidth users. It, it was only ever piloted, so nobody knows about it. But it actually provided access to rich broadband content by trickling content to you if you were on a one-way you know download connection in the north or if you're on you know just a very slow connection in in a rural area right and so there there's always a, a way if there's a will right that i completely agree that i think part of part of this whether we're talking about the inequity around the digital divide or or are these are reflections of our will as a society right and that's uh, yeah, that's the un unfortunate truth around it. So Locke, sure, we, so let's, let's make a trickle happen, but what gets trickled? I think that sort of um, wraps in the question, like what Negon was saying about what we feed through those channels. And, you know, when we have a digital divide and we do have limited access, what comes through the one little channel that we have? And, and how do we change the thinking around being more inclusive around that as well? I, I would argue today we, we we don't fight over what the trickle is and what's over what goes over the single you know uh, availability of the trickle and that we look at what is the role of our public broadcaster what mm -hmm. is the role of the other institutions because when I worked at CBC the providing access over the airways over CBC radio to communities across the country was the number one um, thing right there was no like. If that failed, you know, we would get calls immediately. And w with the internet, that isn't, that has fallen off the radar, right? So whether it's CBC or, or moves up to, you know, as, as it has over the last few years with the CRTC, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there's a, a bigger picture uh, look that has to be requ required there, right? I, I have jokingly um, have said to um, politicians in the past, we should have nationalized the internet in Canada, right? The poor infrastructure of it, 
you know, 20 years ago, right? 30 years ago, 25 years ago, right? That, that would have made a huge difference for accessibility and fairness in this country, right? Yeah, and that was that was the argument that was made at the time, and 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 people who made that argument lost that argument, right? And I think it's one of those kind of, and now we're at another moment, and I think this is one of the things that's interesting. For example, about the Canada Council Digital Strategy Fund, it's misnamed in the sense that if if its intention is to transform society, then it's not about taking up digital; it's about thinking about digital in the context of everything else. And I and I and that misdirection in kind of the title and the allocation of funding. Similarly, you know, with a lot of the new funding that came through the CMF um, in the in the last 10, 15 years, oh, it, CMF is what Let's, Canada Media Fund. I right, thank you. Um, which um, which has had a variety of names over the years, depending on what media we're talking about. Um, but it's this emphasis on it's kind of like that McLuhan esque emphasis on if it's technology we must be doing something about technology instead of always remembering that we're talking about people we're talking about belief systems we're talking about territories you know all of the kind of things that have been said earlier around the table how do we mobilize those resources to transform society that that's our fundamental position and that comes in really direct um, conflict with the nation state building project right so if we're going to funnel money through nation state building systems we're we're always going to be in tension around what is it that the individual artists or what is the individual work supposed to be about and i don't mean that by artist by artist although that's that's sometimes the case but just that kind of how do you have different perspectives at the table in a way that is whole and healthy, right? Mm -hmm. I think that um, when it, a lot of this, the, the implementation of technology, the, what you just said about digital at the CMF comes down to the private industry, right? The, yes, they do have to invest a lot of money in infrastructure. Yes, it costs a lot to run and yes, they have, that, that's a, you know, we know that, but at the same time, they're, I've been a huge proponent at, at the Canada Media Fund to remove the label of convergent and experimental that, that new works shouldn't just be called experimental, digital work shouldn't be called experimental, right? That we should have one fund for content, right? And most people agree and, you know, this, this will now guarantee that I never work for the private broadcasters, but <laughs> they, they have, you know, they are the ones who refuse to change because, you know, it doesn't benefit them, right? The, the obvious thing for the private broadcasters own our mobile and broadband companies. They, they refuse to shift the balance of money from, uh, right, from um, the current BDU structure, the broadcast distribution unit, to uh, us taking, or you know, the people taxing mobile and broadband revenues to contribute back to our content funding. Right? So you know, we, have a, we have a core problem there right now where, where you know, money is going to dry up in our system over time here unless we resolve this, right? And, and, without, and, and so therefore, for me, all this goes back to government policy, right? Gov there has to be forward-looking visionary policies that represent us, right? And, and that, that is our, to me, what our biggest challenge. Um, Lohans, I have a question for you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, and if you're not comfortable answering the question, don't. Um, but in Quebec, um, so I'm just picking up on something that was, uh, that Emmy said about nation building, and, and something that, um, well, it, it's actually picking up several threads from, from Negon, from Mark as well, um, on, on what is art, and what are the roles of our institutions, and what are we funding anyway? Um, when we're looking at cult arts and cultural funding. In Quebec, having lived in Quebec for a decade and now I'm back, um, French, French society has understood for a very long time the, the very close tie between um, cultural identity building and its arts and culture mandate. Um, and I would, I would almost argue that it's very tied to a nation building. It's still very colonial in its approach and its thinking. Is there the beginnings of a glimmer of understanding or self-consciousness and self-awareness in Quebec, Quebec that's growing 
um, around this question. About uh, which question in particular? Um, well, separating nation building from the creation of art. Uh -huh. Creative self-expression being separated from that nation building piece. Is there beginning to be, I think inclusion is, is not the right lens, even though inclusion might be the outcome. Um, it's about separating those two things. Is, is there the beginning of an understanding that creative self-expression and nation building, there needs to be room for creative self-expression that isn't about nation building or the colonial project? I mean, it's, it's a great question. Um, I feel that uh, in the past years in Quebec uh, on the political front, uh, we've had uh, major uh, decisions uh, which were very detrimental to uh, different uh, communities, like ethnic communities uh, in particular. I'm talking about la Charte des Valeurs Québécoise. Uh, I'm also speaking about the um, le projet de loi 21. I don't know if you're comfortable maybe explaining these in English, um, but I feel that like even in Quebec, it's definitely true that uh, the, after La Révolution Tranquille, we've uh, built this whole like arts and culture system, uh, which is very uh, nationalist in its essence, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and it's de it's definitely being uh, denounced and challenged. Uh, by the various social movements that uh, we've been talking about, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, also Me Too, um, trans people rights. Uh, so I feel that like we're definitely confronted to major challenges in Quebec, especially because of the fact that we're, all of our system is deeply rooted in this like white French Canadian nationalism, which is honestly not so inclusive. Thank you, Laurence. That's, that's, that's really wonderful. Thank you for that input and insight. Um, Lindsay, would you like to chime in before we move on to uh, cultural legislation? Yeah, I, I, one thing I'll just share uh, to respond to this question is we, at Creative Interns, we did a two months of online uh, focus groups and we talked to over 60 artists um, with disabilities across Canada. Um, to talk about their experience um, and the digital divide and um, and what really what really was drawn from um, those conversations was this weird experience of um, having all of these impossible issues that 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 they've been um experiencing and dealing with for decades um you know related to access to work uh basic income um uh lack of access to technology and and even you know um online like having access to arts online um you know for many people with disabilities this is this is actually a dream right now uh you know, everything being online, um, <laughs> not to say that it, it is accessible for everyone, but um, it, it, so anyway, so there's been this like, uh, this surreal experience that all of these uh, really difficult issues are now like a mainstream topic. And, uh, and they're, they feel like they're still being left out of that, okay. out of that conversation. Um, and I, you know, and, and I think that, that that's worth putting out there and thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Now we're going to change the, we're going to shift, but it's not really shifting all that much because it's all connected. It's all spaghetti. So we've got three pieces of legislation that are sitting um, with PCH, Patrimoine Canada, Canadian Heritage. Um, the Copyright Act, the Telecommunications Act, and the Broadcasting Act are all slated for major revision. So through that lens of like, what is art and what is its role? And what is the role of our institutions? I think it, it, all, it all cascades and funnels straight into this question of 
what is the critical change that needs to happen when we look at those three acts. So when we look at the Copyright Act, when we look at the Telecommunications Act, when we look at the Broadcasting Act, what is the strategic opportunity that's sitting in front of us? What is the change we need to see? I have so many opinions about this subject oh, matter. Um, I, and I, and I, one of the things that I think is really crucial is that, you know, there are these three acts which are really integrate, well, they should be, they should speak to each other in a much clearer fashion. But, but by speaking about the three of them, we're also speaking about this suite of kind of 12 or 14 other um, federal pieces of legislation and then another layer at the provincial territorial level and then another layer at the municipal level that has to be integrated and then when we're talking about cultural industries we're talking about international regulations and so to unpick and kind of focus on those three acts there are the only kind of strategic thing that we can do is move to more simplified versions of each of those acts and acts that actually have a vision for how it is that we're going to operate um, going forward as a as a set of cultural activities right um, uh, and in particular how they link to uh, regulatory bodies because the broadcast act and the telecommunications act speak to how we regulate the way in which work gets produced and it connects for example to the nfb act the canada council act the all of those all those other pieces of legislation um, and if we tinker with them, then all we're doing is replicating all of the systems that already exist. Um, and the issue, one of the issues that we have is we're in a minority government that can't push through a big change. And so what is the minimum amount of damage that can be done by carving away pieces that are damaging, right? And then really moving towards a vision of what is it that we're trying to do in the future. And I think this is kind of like, that was the promise of the Creative Canada approach, but it and it didn't get there. But it was that that was the promise, right? And so and but I will say that the Copyright Act in particular is such a crapshoot. Uh, I I feel so strongly about the Copyright Act. It's such a crapshoot of very particular things that are meant to benefit um, how our commercial structure works, and not and it doesn't think about how we build culture. And that's what I was getting at in my very earliest comments around. How do we think about what the relationship is between intellectual property and copyright and culture writ whole, right? And that's a conversation really, really way overdue, always important, always needs to be renewed. And so much international implication, as you mentioned earlier. I mean, really, when we talk about copyright, how much control does an individual country have or an individual jurisdiction have when we're talk when we're looking at multinational players in the digital space um, that have no breaks and and no fettering um, anywhere around um, what they're doing and and have a lot of power uh, that isn't being uh, monitored around um, what gets prioritized through algorithms around um, who profits and who doesn't. Um, huge questions that uh, one tiny copyright act um, seems unequal to addressing. Um, so the systems that we're talking about are often much bigger than what, what legislation in an individual country can even address. Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> the issues around copyright are just, I mean, where do we begin? We could do a whole hour and a half on, on that. Um, just, to, just, an, just, just an example of visual, visual art theft that Facebook has introduced is just mind numbing in the ways in which you can, um, like all my friends who are visual artists, it's like, do you put it online um, to be able to, you know, create a marketability for yourself, but then immediately have it stolen and show up on whoever's website is their banner or a t-shirt or whatever. I mean, just the amount of theft alone, um, if you ever check out the kind of work that Christy Belcourt's doing to try to protect her art, uh, it's just an example of um, uh, just, it, it is brain numbing. Um, but what I would say is the challenge I think is uh, involving these three pieces of legislation is the notion of privacy and the ability for individuals to be able to articulate, like the, the, the combining of the state mechanisms um, in relation to privacy and 
uh, and how the state is using uh, major broadcasting legislation, telecommunication legislation that uh, will then continue to like uh, step on the rights of individual peoples in relation to privacy. And, and it's no, no coincidence at all that it's indigenous and black activists who are being targeted uh, because uh, on this sort of march towards telecommunication supremacy mm -hmm. and, and it's no, like no communicate, no, no, sorry, no, no coincidence at all that it's people who are uh, questioning the state um, you know, the uh, Portland is just the latest example, but I'm thinking about the issues of Standing Rock in which telecommunications can be easily controlled by the state in order to not just uh, keep people from communicating, but also controlling their communicative vessels. And so it's just kind of a, and I think art plays right into that. I mean, we have a government right now in Manitoba that has said to universities, we'll only fund you if you are practical. And then when we criticize, we say well, academic freedom, they say, well, you are in your ivory tower freedoms that, you know, COVID-19 has led us to a situation where we all have to be practical now and you have to get out of your ivory towers. And, and that, that's a, I think this pandemic has exponentially created a movement of the state to use telecommunication, art and media to control people, never mind um, to, uh, uh, to, to be, these are forces that were supposed to be about freedom of expression and, and and you know news for example but now more and more the uh, legitimate media sources are being undermined and premiers in ontario for example are opening up their own tv channel with government funding yeah so how do we put measures in place to put controls on abuse of power when it comes to those channels and the freedom of expression um when there's such opportunism around around that. Uh, well, I think one thing that I'm not a fan of, and I don't think it's any, I mean, social media is both the greatest connector and it's also the greatest disconnector that this generation's ever had. It, it, it's, it's resulted in more trauma and more disconnection and more violence than anyone could ever have possibly seen. But yet it is useful for, for indigenous media as an example, or grassroots media to find a platform that mainstream media had no interest in engaging. So so, I mean, it's kind of a double, it's a, it's a kicker because it, it kind of makes you think, uh, it's like capitalism gone amok. And that's what Mark was talking about before. It's the, it's the idea that a market will somehow produce equity where it never will. Uh, markets produce power is what they, and they reproduce power particularly. Uh, those who have money get the greatest say. And so I think being able to uh, look at, like I, like I said earlier that funding the CBC is not economically feasible nor sensical because the issue is that local journalisms are, are the ones in which they are, um, they, they're dying at an exponential rate and those local newspapers and small uh, segments that are startups, um, particularly in the areas of things like podcasting now and in areas like uh, small scale uh, media agencies that are trying to get off the ground in communities, for example, those are ones that I think we want to look at to be able to support the best that we can, because if they don't, if they don't get any support, then what happens is then, then the Facebooks of the world come in and they have a, a local journalism initiative, which is then come in and, and that's only a matter of time before, you know, they only, you're only allowed to use Facebook and then next thing you know, you're right up alongside the fake news stuff. And I mean, it's, it's a real problematic uh, method. And I think if governments are here to produce um, multi perspectives and in the most illusion of sense that I mean, this is my rose colored glasses. If governments are there to to produce goodness and the, the best for all of us, then it would invest in more in local initiatives and it would would particularly look, I, I've, I'm all in favor of funding the CBC completely, but funding local journalism as much, if not more so. Okay. Um, Locke, do you want to respond to that? And then maybe I'll go over to um, Mark. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that, that last point that um, I, I think it's not taking away funding from one thing, one arts organization and giving it to the other. It's first of all, reimagining what they should be, but with that, f finding the funding as we have during COVID, right, for the things that we deem important. On, on, this, on the specific act fronts, um, I think I can say this, I, I highly recommended not modifying each of these acts because there are so many, like Emmy said, and we've seen, and this was four years ago, and we're still, nothing has happened, right? And we know, we know there's a will issue and then there's a, a process issue, right? Putting each act, each change to the House of Commons, 
right? It's, it's going to take, you know, for, I, I can't even guess at the number. We were better off if we implement a new act. We, we could implement an internet act, uh, uh, whatever we want to call it, right? A new society act, what, whatever it is, and have that be all encompassing and override on a lot of things that are not covered. For example, um, the Broadcasting Act is the only one that has the word internet in it. Telecom, um, copyright, NFB, uh, Canada Council, none of them have the word internet in their acts, right? So why not create something overarching that, that you know, where we don't have to debate 14 acts, you know, that will, which we know will never happen, right? I think the other, um, the, the practical flip side of this is that, you know, the European Union really, and France specifically, and with Germany, helped help turn it around. At one point, we were in a position where we never thought we could um, get anything from the tech giants and the streaming companies. But with, with France, France threatened Facebook and brought them to the table where they said, we're going to regulate your algorithm unless you come to the table, right? And we need to actually work together with like-minded countries to, uh, to enact the proper policies, right? And, and the biggest act of all that does need changing is the Revenue Act, right? That's where we, we need to actually force these companies to contribute to our, our tax revenue system. And that's, you know, up through with my friends in Quebec, that's a very, very popularly held position in Quebec, right? Um, and I think at the same time, we can't allow our Canadian broadcasters to slip towards the tech giants, right? They're trying to move, slide towards the tech giants where they're supporting our system less and less because you know those guys are right and and we can't let that happen okay laurence would you like to um chime in and then i'll go back over to uh to uh, mark well i feel that uh, many persons on this panel have uh, probably a deeper knowledge of these pieces of uh, legislation i sort of just had a few like micro comments uh, that honestly I don't find very relevant in the course of this conversation, but something that I thought was very interesting from the, the answers that were just given is uh, relating to institutional change. And this is a point that I had in mind for the first question, uh, because, you know, as we know, like institutions are not neutral actors, and I feel that it's very interesting the points that were that were just made because uh, we've been talking about uh, basically just not reviewing these acts but just abandoning them and then creating whole new ones and I find that this is like a sort of a relating process to creative destruction and I find that this idea of much more radical approaches to institutional change could actually be also the opportunity to ensure that we have much more democratic and much more redistributive uh, policies. I, I completely okay. agree just of, of this idea of with Lockett and, and Laurent, just let's scrap. I mean, we are, <laughs> we are living in a moment where uh, to go back to these like, you know, broadcasting acts from, from the time that I was not, not in elementary school, I'm 40 plus now, like it, to me, it, it's almost nonsensical. In, in, in the teaching world, this is what I'd call busy work for politicians. <laughs> and, and there was hope when Melanie Jolie was dreaming anew and talking about, you know, uh, algorithms and marketing and marketing Canadian talent and getting us in. I mean, to me, that's, that's the kind of conversation that a, that a government needs to have, like France needs to have with, with a, a multinational media giant. I, you're running a country, a country services its citizens. And I think a lot of Western nations, they start to, maybe they get starry eyed in their, like, like, like CBC and they think that they're, they're, they're tech giants or they're corporate or they're corporations when really your job is to protect human beings, not to make profit from them, you know, not to um, throw them into war to fuel your economy. So it comes down to some very basic principles of if you are a government, your number one job is not to make money or to exercise power, but it's to protect human beings. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really, and when, you know, so when, when France does that and, and the world is looking, I'm, oh, there's one country that's willing to, to act like 
their number one priority is their own citizens. Well, what's been really interesting in the COVID crisis, Mark, is is that for the first time in a really long time, maybe since maybe since World War II, but not everybody is going to feel this way. I'm sure Negan certainly won't. Um, that human beings maybe were put ahead of the economy. It's the first time I heard rhetoric where human health was put in front of the economy. And, and you know, that's why, there are many reasons why this is a revolutionary moment. But yeah. one of the most revolutionary things about this moment is that market rationale is no longer as globally hegemonic as it once was. People actually think about living and dying now. Or they think about others living and dying now, as opposed to, and, and I, while I say this, the 1% billionaires are still extracting at a level that's greater than they were prior to the pandemic. But at least 99% of the world is thinking about life and death rather than uh, traffic and profit. I, I'm traffic obsessed in Toronto. But <laughs> that, for me, that's one of those moments where and, and just to come back to, to Negan's really important question, which I feel like could have, could have set the stage for this whole conversation is, and Aku, I hope you don't mind if I go back to, what is art for? What are we doing? What, yeah. Why does art exist? If colonizers can use art to oppress folks and have, why does it exist, right? And, and, and to me, that basic question needs to be answered. And the only answer that's the right answer to me is multiple answers from different groups, because we, right now, we, we've all sort of put on this, um, you know, art for art's sake idea, and, you know, success means it's, it's in the market, and you're, you're, you're not a starving artist, and you have a livelihood through the arts, and you're making money, when really that's the, the most narrowest, and most limited, and most, frankly, most provincial and recent concept of, of art. When we know art and culture predates colonialism, yet we don't really know how it how societies operated with art back then i mean we have a you know we have some idea but in but in in all respects um i think part of the struggle again is how not to have market logic and capital sort of gut the idea of the arts so that it must be you know in order for it to be successful it must be you must it must be your career or you must be making money or you must be gathering media. And I think those metrics, the very idea that art should be this and only this, it's only this one thing and we're only gonna fund this one thing, I think is a great starting point for the, you know, for these, for what we're trying to build after this moment of pandemic or in this moment of pandemic. So I think um, something that's really interesting to think about is, okay, so I was once sitting at a table where someone asked the question, um, what would happen if we eradicate, if there was no art and there was no culture? And I'm like, well, you don't have to look very far. Canada did exactly that to the indigenous people in this, in this country. We, we, we disallowed potlatches and dance and cultural practice. And the result is it, it's soul destroying. So what is the role of art? What role does it, what does role does art and culture play? Riel knew what role it played um, because he was like, it's the artists who are going to bring life back to our people. It's the artists who are going, going to open that back up again. When we talk, when Negan talks about the role of art as a form of resistance, of a, a statement of we are here, of us, I think there is something very, very tied to the root creative self-expression and being a human being and, and the basic rights of human being. And I think the UN gets at this a little bit when it talks about um, human culture, arts and culture being a human right, the right to cultural self-expression being a human right. And now I think we're getting at something. Well, I mean, the, the other thing I would add, sorry to jump in, Lindsay, um, is to just to think about, you know, there was hundreds of years in which Africans were practicing art forms outside of colonial regimes. And what we have are records of the British authorities outlawing drumming, outlawing singing, outlawing a bunch of things. And then you have records of formerly enslaved Africans inventing new instruments, inventing um, dances, inventing martial arts that were masquerading as a dance form or inventing these other forms. So the art is always bubbling up and human beings are, are, are being human through it regardless of any kind of colonial law 
that, and we're in a moment where, you know, we're, we're living the residues, the afterlife of these colonial laws less than a hundred years ago. And, and the people in the streets today that are pulling down statues that are a spray painting graffiti that are doing all kinds of dances in the streets it is it really is you know this could have been 1850 trinidad when they outlawed the drum for the third time uh for all for all we know right so there's the, that kind of human spirit but i uh, i want to stop there because i feel like i'm taking a lot of space and lindsay wants to jump in so, so Go ahead, lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> uh, i just wanted to say it's interesting because um for me, it might be ironic, but um, I think my experience is that the arts has actually been uh, an entry point into uh, livelihood and, and independence and um, being able to better um, uh, access what life has to offer. What I mean, I, I, I think it really um, goes back to the disability arts movement and, and um, you know, a move to uh, more um, funding for disability arts uh, and artists. And I, so I think that for myself, I think that the arts is connected to money in some ways for, for artists with disabilities in a way that has been incredibly liberating and, and empowering. But I mean, not only money, but it's, it's, I think it's not money necessarily, but opportunity. Um, and I think for money was very much tied to that. So it's, it's interesting to think about that. Um, so we, we're, it's, it's now 2.38. I'm just going to point out that we may not get to all of the questions, but I think that the conversation that we're having right now is really critical because it's not just about the funding systems. Um, the, the fact that we're actually talking about the role of art in society and the role of institutions and um, what these pieces of legislation really mean or don't mean in the current context, I think these are foundational to what, what role and how much importance um, we place on art and culture in a society. And um, I think it, it does in some ways inform what funders need to think about um, when they're taking a look at their institutions. Um, so um, maybe we skip um, the conversations on governance structures and arts organizations, because I think in some ways we've covered something that's much bigger than that in this discussion. But I do think we need to talk about how we protect risk taking in a funding environment. Um, because the funding environments, those funding structures, they're not going away tomorrow. And the legislation that's around us, that's not going away either. And risk taking, freedom of self-expression, that's maybe fundamental to what needs to be protected. And that's what legislation a lot of the time is there for. So let's have a, a, a talk about that. Well, can I jump in? Because I've worked with about 100 organizations and, and worked with organizations kind of as big as CBC and then as small as kind of a two-person organization. And I think thinking about um, uh, the, it, uh, thinking about institutions at the service of people, which, which has underpinned a lot of what uh, several people have said today, and thinking about if I think about this particular person and the kind of work that they want to do or that they think is important, what are the systems that can support that, right? And the existing systems that can support it or that can be redirected to support it in some way. And that's up to and including policy and legislation, right? Or if I think about this other community where something needs to happen that is strategic, uh, healthy, what are the, you know, whatever the other kind of values of it, what are the systems that can support that? And what are, who are the people who have uh, the wherewithal to facilitate or to uh, assist um, or just to get out of the way. And I think, you know, the, the whole funding system gets in the way a lot of the time of the work that is going to happen anyway, as Mark was saying, but then also as Lindsay was saying, you know, there are moments when there are resources that come into system for particular groups or particular individuals or particular initiatives that is really helpful and we have to not get in the way of that too. So it is really about understanding what is the complexity and how do I think about it um, in the design thinking world, it would be as, a, as an ethnographic persona, right? It's kind of like, oh, if I have this example, 
of, a, of an artist or of a, of a community that needs to accomplish these things, um, here's how I can here's how I can attach that. And, and building flexibility into those systems will uh, will will build will build the capacity for risk. But fundamentally, the only way you support risk is by supporting risk, right? It's kind of like, and arguably, that's what the whole TV industry has done, right? It's kind of like, you know what? There's a whole bunch of stuff that got funded at a phenomenal level of funding and did was not commercially successful, but was successful by other measures. And so that's kind of, we get to things around, how do you think about evaluation? How do you think about impact indicators? How do you think about something other than revenue as the marker of success? And what about and what about the consequences of risk taking, right? And who, who, who um, is the most? Excuse my language. <laughs> like who comes out on the other end, like worse off or better off? Um, yeah. I feel like this is a great point that uh, you just said, Lindsay. Um, and I feel that, like in the light of COVID, also this question is taking has to be understood and they're like a whole different light right because as the market even the cultural sector is contracting uh, all the programs and all the projects are going to be funded following new risk assessments right and like uh, Dr. Amanda Coles was recently highlighting she was saying that like this creates the perfect uh, conditions for inequalities not only to be reproduced, but also to flourish and like whole new uh, inequalities. And I feel that we need to ask ourselves, what does risk taking means, right? And I completely agree that we need to have a much more, like a larger um, vision as to how we measure impact and how we evaluate uh, risk taking, um, aside from like economic and and quantitative indicators. And I feel that we have to think about, uh, we have to think in terms of like power redistribution, right? Because I feel that like right now, what we see is that we have, like, we still have colonial institutions and systems which are reproducing very specific social orders which benefit them. Um, and this notion of risk is also like, lots of uh, marginalized communities are still very much perceived uh, as risky choices, right? Uh, like women are perceived as uh, riskier choices for leadership positions. Uh, black people are seen as risky because of yet another stereotype. And um, what Emmy was uh, talking about within the film industry, we've also seen that like in the uh, film industry, uh, Telefilm Canada has adopted uh, very progressive measures in order to uh, ensure that we would we would bring uh, cultural products uh, maybe in the past seen as more risky because we had women occupying uh, key leadership positions so I really feel that like this notion of risk taking we need to put it in dialogue with uh, the fact that we need to decolonize our structures this is like a starting point uh, if we want to really create favorable conditions for risk-taking arts practices uh, and arts communities. Uh, cool. Can I can I pose a question to the folks here? Yeah, please do. I'm just wondering, um, and I'm just wondering out alo aloud because on in one part of my brain, I know that um, the artists that that find success are the ones that take a risk, and then the other part of my brain thinks about financial markets and risk, and risk always being connected to profit. Yeah, you know, and I'm just wondering: Is there a way to think of of think in between those two things? Mm -hmm. Because you can't be a good artist unless you take a risk, mm -hmm. right? And then for the folks that hold power, you can't convince them that a risk is a, is 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 part of the definition of excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, like like one thing I like about the tech sector is about you know this idea of fast failure and failing fast. But in, in many places where power is held, the idea of failure is not part of the definition of success. It's really about how fast did you scale your business? Not how many times did you fire your HR director and start new? Because sometimes your excellence could be defined by how many times you get up. Especially, you know, like I think in, in, in an artistic realm, I think about, you know, as a, as, a, as a DJ, if I play a certain amount of tracks 
and people don't dance and then they dance on the seventh track part of my success is that there's been seven songs that have been played and it took me six or seven songs to figure out what will make these people dance right and it's not just i played the right song but i had to think through a, a bunch of sequences fail and then rethink everything again and then try again so i'm just wondering if you know just throwing it out there is there a way to even to problematize or rethink the idea of risk because i feel like when we there are ways where we think just like how i kind of split my head in half i never think about financial markets and, and risk in the same way that i think about being on stage and the risk that you got to take to you know quiet down a crowd before you start a performance kind of thing yeah i completely i was nodding when you were talking about the tech industry approach to taking risk and rewarding failure and experimentation and that's something that i you know we we have to get past the uh, the colonial and the post world war 2 military command and control structure that our organizations are based on right because they're completely based on managing by fear and control and and failure is not an option right and that that is completely the the wrong, wrong way to do it i think one of the solutions to it is by creating constructs to support experimentation one of the great things about the Canada Media Fund Experimental Fund when it was created was it protected things that were deemed to market failures, right? I've sat in a room with the execs from um, the private industry saying like, why do we need documentary? Why do we need interactive? Why do we need VR, right? And, and you know, they're market failures. Right? And I, you know, I, I don't have to go on in this group, but, um, and the other thing, and I wanted to just, touch on number six really quickly is on the governance structure. It, it requires a radical shift in, in the thinking of the governance structure of who's in power, of, of the, who's running these arts organizations. And I, for, for years, I, was the, I would look around in a room in an arts organization uh, at the senior levels or when we're meeting with other um, levels or other orgs, and I was the only person of color in the room for my entire career at senior management levels, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's really hard having the burden to fight for so many things when you're the only one in the room and there's nobody backing you, right? So I just, I think taking that risk, right, will then ensure further risks are taken. Fantastic. Now we're going to start wrapping up. I'm going to ask Negan to go first because he needs to, he needs to leave us. So Negan, final point. If you had one point to make, what would it be as, as we leave this very rich discussion that we've had today? Um, yeah, sorry, I have to go. I thought uh, everybody's, my, my phone just started going berserk about 15 minutes ago. So um, for a bunch of things that are happening, uh, and I'm also on press deadline for today. So, um, so the, uh, all I'd say is just about art as being, um, uh, the, one, the one thing I was going to say earlier when we were talking about art was that, uh, <laughs> Like art, the, the whole the concept that art isn't art isn't really a um, something that you do for appreciation or performance. That's not the only way art operates. Like so, uh, what we often deem as commercial art is indigenous art, meaning people did it for their lives and they did it because of um, uh, you, like you don't sing a bear song in the hopes that you make profit. Uh, you're singing a bear song to recognize your relationship with the bears. And that you hope that that relationship will be revisited next year. You that's why you sing it again, and then then the next thing what you do is you're reaffirming your relationship and commitment to having a healthy interaction with the bears. And by default, uh, you can have water to drink and earth to have food from and and for, and air to breathe. Um, so none of this is about like trying to make. Um, some kind of method of profit. This is, this is a, uh, your profit, if anything, is that you get to have water to drink. And so like our indigenous art is based on a, on a notion of relationality, uh, which is I think what Lindsay talked about before as art being a relationship building mechanism, or what I often refer to it as a gift building mechanism. So the more that we can start building notions of art that isn't based in uh, outcomes that are based on like exhibits in art galleries, which are such a redu reductive form of art um, or that art that's produced for the purposes of profit and gaining advertising dollars, the sooner that we can get to art of what it actually is, which is relational building mechanisms, perhaps maybe then we'll get to a sense of art that can be decolonial. 
And I apologize that I have to go. Like I said, I'm getting like rain down upon me in terms of messages. So um, no. I'm miigwech everybody for having me. A uh, huge uh, for participating, Nigon. Thank you. And yeah, I'm sorry that I have to run, but um, it's like the world is falling, and <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I've, I, I've, I was supposed to answer my editor ten minutes ago. So okay. okay, go make it happen. Thank you so much. Let's do a little round table. Um, Locke, would you like to go next? So uh, for, yeah. for me, I, I think we've touched a lot on, on diversity and um, the, the last point on, on diversity is regional um, imbalance, the regional imbalances question that you had. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to point out that both, both of my um, uh, two teams that I co-founded at Radio, CBC Radio 3 and the NFB Digital Studios were based in Vancouver and BC and with teams spread out across the country in Winnipeg as well, right? And, yeah. and I think that, um, you know, that we are just missing um, uh, such a treasure trove by not working and not empowering um, diversity at so many levels, including regional diversity. So. Yeah. Um, Laurence? Sure. Uh, well, thank you again for this uh, incredible opportunity uh, and this panel was very uh, instructive and uh, rich. Uh, as a labor scholar, I feel that I should maybe end on a labor note. Um, I feel that uh, honestly, as we all know, uh, we're very lucky in Canada, we have a very strong funding system for the arts, uh, for the cultural and creative industries. Um, that being said, we also need to acknowledge the fact that the value uh, created by artists and arts workers uh, is not fairly redistributed. Um, cultural and creative industries are still uh, nowadays relying on an army of freelancers and self-employed workers who are still to this day denied access to labor protections. And even in Quebec, where we have two pieces of legislation regulating work arrangements between artists and their promoters or producers, uh, which are based on a union or quasi-union model, artists are still very much maintained in precarious situations. As you know, they have low income, they often have no safety net, and yet they highly contribute, as we uh, discussed today, to the Canadian society. Um, this is true not only of artists and arts workers, but it's also true uh, for a growing mass of workers who cannot, to this day, uh, meet their basic needs even if they work full-time jobs. And uh, the COVID-19 has had dramatic consequences on artists' capacity to earn their living. Uh, you can take a look at the recent data from the I Lost My Gig survey, and you'll see that, for, uh, for example, artists have lost an average uh, 36 contracts because of the pandemic, and this represents an average 25K. Um, I was really happy that Amy uh, brought uh, universal basic income uh, when she spoke earlier. Uh, I am um, participating uh, to the campaign led by the Ontario Basic Income Network right now, uh, and we're advocating for a universal basic income for every Canadian who needs it. And I feel like uh, if you want to join this movement, uh, please check out their website. It's very important, not only for artists. I'm part of the campaign uh, for universal basic income in the arts, uh, but also for every Canadian who needs it. Yeah, yeah. They, we're not alone in the gig economy, for sure. Lindsay, um, you're next. Oh, thank you um, for this mind-blowing conversation. Um, I think I want to say I, I appreciate Laurence and lock your comments around um, risk-taking and the need for um, to think about who are making in, in governance structures who are making these decisions around how uh, these risks are being taken and, and who it, who is being protected or supported um, and so maybe I'll just leave by saying that yes um, I, I also went on to the Canada Council board of uh, because I, I actually didn't realize I didn't know who was on the board, and I looked at the and I was like, yeah, nobody, nobody with a disability is on the board at the Canada Council, and and we are about we have the Canada Accessible Act, um, 2025. We're supposed to have a fully accessible public, um, 
infrastructure. Uh, so it, so there's that, and then and then also you know in thinking about governance, we we need to think about that within our own um, organizations and what we in, as individuals how we are building those leaderships and who like this is the decisions that we're making around who who we want to work with and how can we start expanding that um, thinking and how can we start bringing putting more um, marginalized uh, individuals into those leadership positions so that we can actually start to build and strengthen uh, those those vulnerable groups so mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Mark? Um, final words. I feel like um, so much of what I, what I would say is final words have already been said, but um, I appreciate everyone on the call. And I feel like the, when, we, when we are asked to have conversations about um, policies, um, I love to see that we're able to sort of um, have a meta conversation about more than just what um, what is needed to happen at this moment or what needs to change when really, um, you know, what I, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. I feel like the, the moment, part of the moment of change is about how do we recover or recoup the, the arts as something that has language that's relevant to communities and individuals, um, something that is not reliant or, or um, reliant on the language of the market or la or the language of organization of uh, I should say corporations so that one can start to, to think about the arts as something more than um, how um, the status quo wants us to believe the arts are you know careers the arts are um, not important and they should always be the first to be cut or they're frivolous or uh, because I feel like we all many of us come from lineage and then we have ancestors that you know in which art was um absolutely present in their life and it was critical to their humanity and i feel like when we have conversations like this we, we get more people on the page thinking about art as a form of humanity and and why and then we can have more difficult conversations about why it's not important in society or why people want to cut it or or how it's managed you know particularly by um funding agencies but i feel like yeah, I think I feel like the for us being able to think about art as, as this uh, a form of humanity gives us a different lens to to wrestle back the concept so that it's actually usable to our kids and to our aunts and our uncles and people in our family. Fantastic, Emmy. Would you like to round things off? All right. Well, then I get the um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was such a pleasure and I have to say this is one of the things that motivated me to participate in this is because I saw the list of people who I get, would get to have a conversation with and so I was very excited about that um, and I guess that you know one of the things that I would uh, for, for my kind of parting thinking is I want to hold the complexity of this conversation and think about how to bring those conversations forward in other environments that I find myself in um, and my you know hope to continue to develop my ability to listen, learn and unlearn, relearn, rethink, revise, all of those kind of terms. Um, I also, um, and I, I know we're gonna, you know, it kind of brings it back around to the question of sustainability, but I also want to take a moment and say thank you to Aku and to Devin for that fantastic drawing that I can see. Um, and, um, and Aku, thank you for facilitating this whole process because um, that's, a, that's a lot of really interesting big ideas to bring to the table and in conversation with one another. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And I'll just echo that. Um, this was an incredibly broad ranging conversation. We, um, we blew the original list of 10 questions I had out of the water. Um, I wish we could have gotten to the two that we didn't get to plumb in the time that we had together um, a little more deeply. But that said, I think we did all manage to touch on all of those points that uh, we were looking to discuss today. Um, another whole day could be spent on regional disparities, on, on copyright law and the legislation frameworks that, uh, that bundle this all up, and on governance, um, because it's clear that the old, the old ways of doing things you know, we, we really need to 
to think outside um, the realm that we've been um, used to thinking in. So thank you all. This is a fantastic discussion. And I think it will lay the groundwork for a lot of discussions to come. So.